great honour and pleasure to have a chance to talk to Sir Richard Friend, the Cavendish Professor of Physics at Cambridge University. Richard, where and when were you born? I was born in January 1953 yeah. in the Middlesex Hospital in London, where my father was a junior doctor. Mm -hmm. And I lived uh, in and around London for the first three and a half years of my life. Which um, you don't remember very vividly, I don't suppose. I have recollections of the house we lived in, I think it was in Radlett, and I can remember sitting in a pram looking at paint peeling off the wall and not really thinking it should be peeling off the wall. <laughs> and probably another tidy thought to have as a first memory. <laughs> And then we moved to Staffordshire. My father got a job as a hospital consultant at the uh, Stoke Hospitals. And we moved, by coincidence, my mother's family were from Mid Staffordshire. And we spent two years living with uh, her brother, who farmed somewhere near Stafford. Mm. So a lot of my memories were the farmyard. Oh, right. Pigs, cows, and so mm. on. There were still one or two horses there. Mm. And then when I was five, we moved to uh, actually a large, rambling, rather very ugly old rectory where I grew up uh, again in Staffordshire. Mm. Sometimes people like to talk about further back in their family, grandparents. Did you have grandparents who you remember or influenced you? Oh, I had only one uh, grandparent who was uh, alive more than a year or two after I was born, who mm. was my father's mother. Mm. She was not a scientist. No. So that, that was not a strong influence. <laughs> but basically you paint a picture of a middle class uh, medical background, is that roughly right? It was a middle class medical background, uh, of course in different ways. Both of my parents had had, uh, had to struggle hard to get where they got to. They mm. had uh, lifted themselves beyond where you know, life had probably seemed. Mm set to place them. Mm. So the work ethic was, was very dominant at home. Mm. Yes, that, that raises the question of your parents' temperament or character. I mean, your father was a very hard-working, distant figure, or what? Well, he was hard-working, um, but actually very playful and approachable, mm. um, and always amused to be confronted with something he wasn't expecting. Uh, so, uh, though a figure of authority, not in a straightforward way, uh, he he was always happy to. Mm. Well, when he wasn't, when he had, when he felt like it, he was happy to engage in whatever mm. sort of conversation we wanted mm. to have with him. Mm. And he read. Your parents read to you and sort of stimulated you in various ways like that. Oh, I'm sure I was given a wonderful middle class mm. background. Mm. Yes. Were you? Did you have siblings or? I have a brother mm. uh, who's a professor at Oxford. Mm. So Older or? He's younger, he's mm. a year younger. He's a transplant surgeon. He, mm. he was a long time in Cambridge, but he mm. moved to Oxford. Mm. So we were both doing what our parents wanted us to do, which was mm. to work hard and achieve. Mm. So you were encouraged and pushed on quite a bit by your parents in, in that usual way? The sense that hard work was the way to uh, um, improve one's lot and to get somewhere worthwhile is not lost on us. <laughs> um, wh what was your first school? Um, where did you go to school? In, St in Stafford? Or? My primary school was uh, actually a small Catholic, uh, um, basically girls' school that took mm. small boys for a while until mm. they became um, uh, unbearably beastly and then we were sent off somewhere. Mm. So my I, I was taught by nuns at an early mm. stage, but then I was packed off to, to boarding school. I was sent off at the age of eight to mm. an absolutely dreadful um, prep school. You want to name this? I don't suppose it's still going, at least I hope it isn't. It's, you know, it was a place called the Old Hall at Wellington, which is now part of what is called Telford. And it was absolutely grim. Mm. What but the usual, usual things, beatings and torture I mean, bullyings and it's the general um, beastliness of, of boarding schools at mm. that time that mm. I, I think in many ways it was a sort of peer group we were encouraged not to be very nice to one another and of course the, the sense of remoteness and mm. uh, 
dreadful food and freezing to death on mm. sports fields and being prevented from using our brains usefully, mm. all of that. Did it not get good towards the end? That's usually what happens when you become a prefect or head boy or something. The, the then prep, prep school, there was nothing good about it. Mm. Nothing. nothing. Oh, that's interesting. Um, uniquely grim. Were your parents aware of your suffering or you, in the usual way, keep it to yourself? Well, they had, uh, in many ways, uh, probably had a harder time. My mother was orphaned by the time she was um, 11. And, in fact, her happiest times were boarding school. Mm. She, she found more friendship because her mm. home situation was very, mm. very bleak. Mm. So I'm sure they didn't enjoy us being away. Mm. They were very close to us, but they somehow felt this was what had to happen. And there was a sense that we needed to be sent off to a proper public school. Mm. Um, because that was seems the right thing to do, and of course one had to have Latin to get to a, mm. a public school, and Latin meant going off to a prep school. So your your younger brother was there too. I think. He was there a year after mm. me. Yes, and that made it slightly more tolerable having at least one friend. Well, I think one of the sort of beastlinesses of um, boarding schools in at that time was that what ought to have been sort of natural sibling support and friendship mm. was somehow not something one should be seen to be um, engaging mm. in. So mm. it didn't make a lot of difference, no. Interesting. So you, any signs of affection and warmth and so on were sissy and not you? It was a, sign, a mm. potentially a sign of weakness, I would say. Mm. Um, well, we'll pass over that <laughs> quickly <laughs> then. Were you, I mean, well, except... I, I was talking to a mathematician um, recently, a very distinguished mathematician, and I said, when did you first show an interest in mathematics? And he said, well, my mother tells me that the only way she could get, keep me quiet when I was having a bath at the age of two was to give, him, give me sums. This was Peter Swinson Dyer. Ah. Did you do any physics at this, um, or anything that might later lead you on into physics at this oh, school? The, 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 the event that I can remember was my first Meccano set. Uh, it's a bit of a cliché, mm. but, uh, but Meccano was absolutely special. Mm. At what age was that? Oh, about five. Ah. So I, 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 uh, eventually I assembled a, a, a wonderful Meccano set. I have a better collection of gears and cogs and pulleys. And I wasn't very interested in the bits to make the bodywork of mm. whatever it was I was trying to make. It was assembling gearboxes and mm. that sort of thing. Just that was, that was happiness. Mm. And that continued right through your school days, or at least your earlier school days, did it? I mean, you've got set 1A, set 1B, or whatever, Meccano. Oh, uh, well, I worked my way through the sets, and mm. beyond set 5, I just used to go and buy the pieces individually, so I could get more gears and fewer mm. ancillary bits, which weren't useful, mm. in my view. <laughs> and, th and then, oh, moving ahead a little, uh, by... I think when I was 11, I got my first electronics set. I, I came in right at the start of transistors. Mm. I never managed to electrocute myself on thermionic valves, mm. but transistors were, that was wonderful. Mm. So I, and you made uh, wires as they used to be called. Radios and mm. um, um, water detectors and you know, all the sorts of things you could make with a couple of transistors. Mm. I, I did that. There's a strong tradition in Cambridge Science, and British Science, of sort of hands-on, rootling around with your hands, and some of the great scientists I've interviewed mm -hmm. have talked about their continuing making of gadgets up to Crick and Watson and beyond. Mm -hmm. I mean, is this something that's remained with you, an interest in using your hands in science, literally? Using my hands in science, I think science has suffered. Mm -hmm. uh, I think too much of it has become black box. Mm -hmm. um, of necessity, a lot of electronic measurement mm. um, is now too complex for you to be able to build your own amplifier and mm. expect to perform as well as mm. something that comes in a box. Mm. A lot of the business of getting data comes at the end of some relatively complex uh, computerized data acquisition mm. and data handling. Mm. So it's not gone away, mm. but I don't think it's as immediate mm. as um, the business of, of making measuring. Mm. Uh, and you could no longer make useful tools for your science now? Well, I make useful tools at home. I mean, I'm a relatively enthusiastic woodworker, mm. but 
but but science, and of course, I I spend too much of my time writing grant proposals and <laughs> not enough time uh, at the uh, at the lab bench. Mm. That's in the nature of. Is there a lab life. bench now? Even I mean, there's well, there are optical benches mm. and there are electrical benches and mm. there are clean rooms and mm. yes, I'm heavily oriented towards experiment. I mm. believe that most creativity happens uh, through doing experiments, mm. through observation. Mm. Well, we'll come back to that, that's an interesting aside. Um, where did you go to school after this grim, grimly place? I went to rugby at mm. the age of 13. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why I was sent to rugby, there was no family connection at all with any of the major public schools. Mm. And I I didn't win an entrance scholarship, but I got into the entrance scholars form. So I had a diet of classics mm. and a tiny bit of science. Mm. And I was so-so at classics and I didn't need to be taught the science, I just knew it, which irritated everybody else in the class. In How did you know it? I don't know. I, I, I didn't. I mean, it was sort of like being told stuff that I had known anyway. You don't believe in reincarnation? Do you? I don't believe in reincarnation, <laughs> but it, somehow it was sort of common sense, and it was that was the point that I, I think uh, school mm. became interesting. I was after the sort of formalism to somehow provide a structure around which I wanted to understand the real world, the physical mm. world. When you say you knew it, you knew biology, physiology, physics, well, I, chemistry, biology mathematics? Biology was somehow escaped me, but it, physics, chemistry, and the associated mathematics, mm. uh, which I, suppo I suppose I thought that's where I wanted to be. I think mm. it was, this was the golden age of electronics, and that mm. somehow the magic of uh, little bits of stuff that could uh, mm. transform small signals into large, or mm. make radios work, uh, had got me. And that mm. was very interesting. Were there any, there's sometimes a special teacher or teachers who influence one, um, was there anyone at rugby in that way who? A rugby science in the 1960s was absolutely stunning. It was a great paradox that the school rated its science as nothing, that the, mm. the clever boys were discouraged from taking science mm. A-levels, mm. they were supposed to go very rapidly through classics. Mm. But the real strength of the school was the science. Mm. There were some very gifted uh, physics and chemistry teachers. Um, mm. Several had uh, Oxbridge PhDs and mm. were, in every sense, um, excellent scientists whose mm. knowledge of science was was, was profound, and, and that, that came across. Most, you know, most of the rest of the school was completely uninterested in this. But <laughs> it was wonderful for me. Mm. Can you remember any of their names? Or oh yes, yes. Um, there's a very, very famous um, physics teacher, Jeff Foxcroft, mm. um, who was a, a national pioneer of the Nuffield teaching schemes, who um, just sort of knew electronics in a way that no one else did, so he, he was very special. There were actually one or two chemistry teachers um, uh, who, who I remember very well. Wonderful sort of nineteenth-century figure, George Daisley, who used to do extreme. How do you spell his name? Daisley. Yeah. Um, I, I have to stop and think. Like a Daisy with an L U I or something. With a Z in it, yes. yes. Uh, and, and he really went into the pyrotechnics mm -hmm. um, and felt that um, you know, chemistry involved making things, and if they were dangerous, so much the better. So he those were the good old days when health and safety were a long way away. Well, I had a special fume cupboard to do my own experiments, and he decided I needed to do cyanide preparations. So he drew a wonderful skull and crossbones in chalk on the fume cupboard glass. And for weeks we had these lethal concoctions which just left there. Meanwhile, other classes came by and used the main benches, and <laughs> nothing happened to them. Of course, that's <laughs> the, uh, mm. that probably a, 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 would lead to instant imprisonment these days. Mm. And then there was uh, a younger, actually just graduated from, I think, Cambridge, uh, John Allen, who was, uh, really gave me an undergraduate education uh, for A-level. It was wonderful. Mm, you were lucky. 
What about uh, other interests? Um, we mentioned sports before we started talking. Are you, did you play any games? Well, I, I, I discovered after I left school that I didn't mind games, but the imposition of compulsory exercise was mm. something I resisted at all costs. I went to enormous lengths to avoid playing organised sport, particularly rugby. Mm. It, it took a large fraction of my waking hours to Think of find ruses to avoid... Um, it's either compulsory performance or compulsory attendance to watch others, and, mm. and both seem to me to be completely unreasonable. Mm. And what about music? Music, I wish I could say I could play, but I never got round to learning how to play. I love listening, but I mm. don't think I'm a musician. I, I can hear it, but I can't reproduce it. Mm. And what, what music? I mean, you still listen to a lot of music. Yes. Live or...? Uh, life from time to time, mm. um, music of all sorts. Mm. I have a fairly large collection of classical CDs, mm. but I, I suppose the uh, going through the sixties, the the, uh, the collection of uh, the great um, sort of musical events of one's childhood, mm. <laughs> yeah, Beatles, yeah, mm. um, all of that. I mean, mm. yes, and that's still very much part of what I like to listen mm. to, and jazz and. Jazz I've come to later, and my wife enjoys jazz very much, and um, I think jazz, jazz is magical. I suppose, I mean, it's a sort of cliche, but, but I mean, Miles Davis I, I just listen to and I never get tired of. Hmm. Does music, some, some uh, thinkers find that music stimulates them in their thought, but either having heard something, they then try and write or solve problems. Does it affect you, to think, in your creative life at all, music? I haven't stopped to think about that. I don't... It certainly affects me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the right sort of music will... It's almost like a sort of opiate. I mean, it can, mm -hmm. it can put me into... It can calm me. I don't think I've correlated that with any moment of creativity. Mm -hmm. Um, because uh, one of the gurus in my field um, claimed, of course, which pleased me, that there were three true vocations, music, mathematics and anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've always interested in the association between music and mathematics as, as a result. Well, I'm not a very good mathematician, mm -hmm. and I don't think I'm a musician, so mm -hmm. I think I'd probably fail that test. <laughs> or even an anthropologist. Well, I've um, never tested myself as that. I prob <laughs> probably not. I wasn't going to fail at that too, <laughs> <laughs> or not attempted. Um, you mentioned your first school was a Catholic yes. girls' school. Yes. Um, that wasn't because your parents were Catholic. No, they weren't, no. Mm. Were they of any religious persuasion? Well, my father um, w was not, but uh, his, uh, um, his grandparents had arrived somewhere in Eastern Europe um, and were, were Jewish, um, mm. but they had lapsed, um, mm. his family had lapsed. Mm. My mother was solidly C of E, mm. and, and certainly not Catholic. What about yourself? Um, oh, well, I was pushed through the, uh, the C of E world, mm. which, um, uh, to the extent that it, uh, it matches with a sort of humanism mm. um, approach to the need for a, what one could call a civilised society, I'm mm. content with it. So you, how would you classify yourself? Um, agnostic, atheist or C of E? <laughs> Which some people would say was the same as both of those, but anyway. Well, I, I hope I would characterise myself as, as um, tolerant. I, I am completely allergic to anyone telling me what I should think on on, on these sorts of matters, and I try very hard not to do, do anything which imposes my thinking on anybody else, because I, I would be not true to my principles if I were to do that. But the best of C of E is its tolerance. Mm. What about the atheistic fundamentalists like Richard Dawkins? What is your view of them? Well, it, I mean, it, Richard Dawkins uh, having a good go at a C of E bishop who, you know, who one would regard as a pretty tolerant sort of person. It's, mm. it's almost like going to a blood sport, isn't it? It's wonderful. Um, <laughs> I, 
I think it depends where you where you are. I think in in the UK, in many parts of Europe, one can take a very relaxed view about the role of organised religion um, of a Christian persuasion um, and its impact on society. I'm shocked every time I go to the USA by the fundamentalism there, which I see as, um, I mean, I think fundamentalism is, is, is usually bad. And somehow um, what Richard Dawkins has, Dawkins has done is, um, is just to have focused, I mean, somehow you need to be, if you like, as extreme in the other way to be able to confront that. Mm. And I do admire him for what he's, what he's been able to do um, his uh, TV programs on, uh, I think they're called The Root of All Evil, and they mm. used to be mm. um, <laughs> provocative. Yes. I thought were fascinating. Mm. So I admire what he does. I don't personally find it something that I sign up to in, mm. uh, unreservedly. Mm. But I certainly um, give him the full freedom to p push his line. Putting, uh, taking this just one stage further, um, and it's well known that some of your great physics predecessors, mm. like Newton, mm. were pretty religious people. Mm and that Einstein, although he wasn't signed up to any particular religion, talked mm. quite a lot about the, the sense of wonder and awe, which he saw as akin to a religious feeling. Um, you as a celebrated physicist, uh, having looked deep into the mysteries of the physical universe, do you see on the other side of it any anything more than wonder and awe? Or? Well, let me make a a side observation, and that is that I don't think that religious belief or lack of it correlates at all with ability as a physicist. Mm. I don't, I think they seem to involve different parts of our brains. Of course you can make the connections, and I think in general um, one wouldn't it's hard for a physicist to be as profoundly athe atheistic as, as uh, Dawkins mm. comes across as, and I perhaps I haven't spoken to him directly. I think sometimes you need to sort of know someone well to understand what they really think, as mm. opposed to how they are projected. Mm. One is aware that with physics, that a lot of what we deal with um, appears to be certainty, that, that, that our models work um, quite astonishingly well. Um, but we're aware that they're not reality. They're models which map reality insofar as we know them to work. And that when you stretch a bit beyond that, um, you, you have no secure foundation. And a lot of the contemplation that takes place in cosmology, which I don't do, uh, is sort of drifts fairly quickly into what one could call theology. Well, I was just thinking that as you were speaking, because two of the well, someone I've recently interviewed is Neil Turok, mm. and uh, he's one of the um, protagonists now of parallel universes and mm. and theory and so on. And, and it sounds very religious to me <laughs> that there is another reality just the other side of thirty to the minus, or um, uh, you know, a very small gap between us and another reality. It sounds very close to religion. I. I think it's certainly the language that you would see in religion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not. I don't know. I don't think it's. I don't think the relationship is that straightforward. But certainly, this sense that you that we there's a lot we don't understand, and mm -hmm. that we're, we're sort of it's if you like the paradox that, that that some of what we have done and make use of works so well that we're confronted with the fact that has no particular right to do that, or that we mm. um, may be confronted with a different description one day. Mm. And it's that sort of sense of being both both certain and uncertain, which mm. is probably mm. good. Yeah. Well, as, as Martin Rees was saying, you know, we know very well what happened back to one millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, but before that we have no idea. 
Ah, mm. uh, well, um, at, at the risk, of, uh, I mean, I'm sure I should be controversial, but I've always chosen my science to be in areas where I can keep going back and measuring. Mm. And I have uh, immense respect for what has been done in, in the field of cosmology. Mm. But all you can do there is observe. You can't design your experiment and do it. Mm. And I, there are many areas of science where our ability um, to get things right without being able to measure in many ways from many angles mm. um, is, is rather limited. Mm. So, so I, I've avoided that problem, <laughs> choosing to work in areas where I can be sure that uh, observation is reliable. Mm. One last question on that. I mean, Dawkins and others seem to think there is some clash between science and religion. In other words, um, you know, if you are a real scientist, it's impossible to believe in religion. I think you implied when you talked about different parts of the brain that you don't see that, that you think that they are dealing with different kinds of questions. Is that right? I, 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 I suppose I've been lazy. I haven't really pushed myself if I did, I might find myself becoming an atheist. Mm. One cannot deny that we seem to have a need to create something like a religion. Mm. Uh, and to deny that would be to deny history. I don't, I don't like the feeling that I need to abandon a sort of rationalist uh, approach to uh, knowing what, what has gone on in the past and what may mm. happen in the future. But I, I don't know. Hmm. Well, it sounds more like an agnostic to me, but um, <laughs> which is my preferred outcome. I don't know. Um, let's get back to rugby. Um, you did specialise, although they wanted you to do um, other subjects. You specialised in science, and you presumably got lots of A, high A's in. Yeah, I was, I was pretty good at it. Yes, yes physics. And yes. How, many, what, how many A's did you do? Just out of interest. I did, did, uh, I did three A-levels when I was 16, uh, which you're not allowed mm. to do these days. Yeah. And you got past them all well. I did, yes. Yeah. yes. And what did you do for the next two years? I, as, was one, as one was supposed to do in those days, I stayed on for um, a year beyond A-level to mm. uh, uh, practice for the scholarship exam at mm. the Cambridge, because uh, getting scholars to Oxbridge was the sort of thing that the great public schools felt mm. they had to be successful at. Mm. So I had a, an interesting year being taught in very small groups, mm. taking my science actually probably more chemistry than physics, mm. um, a long way. Mm. Why Cambridge? Or did you try Oxford as well? Gosh, I think, there was, I think there was a discussion between my father and my housemaster, mm. and I was told that I was applying to Trinity College ah. Cambridge. Because of its well-known science traditions. I'm, I'm not sure what the explanation was, well. but it, that, that was that was what one did, and I, mm. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a bad choice. Mm. And that's where you went. That's where I went. Yes. Mm. To read, to read natural sciences. Mm. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do chemistry or physics. Mm. It was one of the two, and uh, it, it sort of emerged that it was physics. Mm. During, during the first year as an undergraduate. Mm. I, I mean, it may not be true now, but physics was taught in a much more intellectually appealing way. It was, um, it was, just, it was structured around ideas rather than facts. Mm. And chemistry, the ideas were there, but they weren't presented so interestingly mm. or profoundly. Who were the major figures or any major figures who as teachers, lecturers, supervisors influenced you as an undergraduate? I, I think I was, a, I was a pretty unruly undergraduate and I, I think I took the view that I, I, I would learn things largely by myself. Um, I, mean, I enjoyed just the sort of elegance and carefully structured lectures that Gordon Squires gave in physics actually in the first year. And Gordon is uh, a wonderful teacher. He's a, uh, a, a, a director of studies in physics at Trinity, of course, uh, but a wonderful lecturer. 
I was intrigued by Brian Peppard, who in, I think most would say was not an easy uh, person to learn from as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. He gave a very interesting lecture course, from which I think I, I thought I learned nothing at the time, but looking back I learned a lot. And he, he, uh, he did give me some supervisions in my final year, which, which felt rather terrifying. But he was very good in that he did stretch, um, not by going very deep or mathematically involved um, into problems, but just sort of testing why why I believed something I'd been told in a lecture and getting me to think, and that was that was very enjoyable. Hmm. Was he then Cavendish professor? He was then Cavendish professor. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. Um, are there any of your friends of that particular period? Did your brother come up, by the way, as well? My right? brother came uh, and, and read medicine mm. at uh, Magdalen a year mm. later. Yes. A year later. Mm. Yes. Were there any of your friends from that, from the graduate period, who you stayed in contact with or who influenced you much? Or? Well, it was a very good undergraduate crop at Trinity. Um, uh, Stephen Elliott and Mike Neuberger were exact contemporaries there. Of course, both um, fellow of Trinity now. Mm. Doing the same? Well, oh, Stephen moved to chemistry, and Michael, uh, of course, is a very distinguished um, member of the laboratory for microbiology. Mm. And he was a physicist for two years and then mm. knew he was going to move to biochemistry. Uh, he, he probably had better advice than the rest of us as to <laughs> what, what he should be doing. Did you still have this sense, which intrigues me, that you knew a lot of this already and then you were just revisiting it or relearning, or were you moving up to a level where it was pretty new? Ah, yes. Um, well, first, my first undergraduate year, I did very little work and I knew the whole of first year chemistry, uh, largely from what I'd been taught at rugby. Hmm. Which is probably why I didn't want to carry on with chemistry. So I, didn't have to, I didn't have to think very hard. Uh, the physics was physics. I've always found hard, mm. and it was presented. Uh, I I think I've always had to sort of stretch myself to understand mm. it, mm. and I, I I did find it taught in the right way. Mm. It was it was designed to be stretching, mm. and it was and it was. Yes, I found it to be stretching. Still do. <laughs> It's interesting you said you weren't much of a mathematician or not mm. a particularly good mathematician. I, it always, I always assume that physicists, or in the case of Martin Rees, he said the same thing. He said he wasn't particularly good at mathematics. It always surprises me that, as an outsider, I thought the two, it was an essential tool, but I suppose it... Well, you only have to have a tool that is good enough to solve the problem. Mm. And a lot of the physics problems are not, don't require very... There are many problems in physics which um, I require deep and profound mathematics to solve, and mm. those are not the ones I went off to try and solve. <laughs> right. Um, were you do what else were you doing particularly? Were you involved in any other studentish things, drama or rowing or? I've uh, never rowed. I never saw the point. It, mm. it seems it struck me as a curiously non-cerebral thing to do. Mm. Uh, apparently. <coughs> academically oriented university. Mm. And being an undergraduate in the uh, early 70s was a time to be um, fairly left-wing and revolting. Mm. And, and there were just the general buzz of you know, alternative activities. That, mm. uh, not, nothing very organised, nothing that mm. would have happened within a society. Mm. So I had a pretty wild bunch of friends. <laughs> um. I mean, it seemed to be the important thing to mm. be, just to sort of enjoy mm the uh, end of capitalism or whatever. <laughs> and the Vietnam War, the end of the Vietnam War? Uh, the Vietnam War somehow never seemed to matter very much. It seemed to be an American problem rather than a British problem. Hmm. That's interesting. As I was at King's, I came to King's mm. at that time, and mm. there were a number of people in King's, like Martin Bernal and others, mm. who were quite involved with it. Mm. But you're probably right, most of the fellows weren't mm. so much. And King's was pretty left-wing college mm. as well. Um, 
it sounds as if you're going to automatically decide to go on and do a PhD. Is that what you did? Or yes, I didn't have any better ideas. Mm. And you went on to do it on what subject? I ended up doing it in physics, but very much where physics meets chemistry. Mm. I, I joined a group of uh, Abiofi, um, uh, who was leading a, a, a group that actually migrated from physical chemistry. It was the group that Bowden, who I, I was dead before I arrived, um, mm. had brought to Cambridge and to the college. Uh, no, sorry, not college, in, in surface and friction. Um, and I think under Neville Mott, mm. um, it had moved across to be an activity within the Cavendish but it was always regarded as not quite... It wasn't colloid science. It wasn't colloid, I'm mm. incorrect in mm. that. Mm. It, was, it was friction and lubrication, superficial physics, I think it was mm. called, mm. without any sense of irony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, what was interesting then was that this, these were s some of the materials that were of interest, actually, because they make good lubricants, things mm. like aluminum disulfide, were, uh, real, uh, were appreciated as materials that were interesting as semiconductors. And mm the sort of thought that materials you might make transistors out of um, could themselves be chemically complex, I just found intriguing the sort of sense that there was a, you know, these, these were two worlds that weren't necessarily seen as uh, having any useful conjunction. Mm -hmm. It seemed a, a nice place to explore. Mm -hmm. So the thesis was about semiconductors, was it? Or the, the thesis was about um, rather um, obscure, well, I would, now, I would now call it obscure at the time, I thought it was vital, a property of um, metals uh, when the electrons in the metal are constrained, so that rather than travelling around in all three dimensions, they're constrained either to travel just within a layer or along a chain. And in those circumstances, they're not stable. They naturally distort, uh, and they do that usually at a low temperature down towards liquid helium temperatures, they, they uh, reorganize the, the crystal lattice to put in a mm. distortion which um, switches them across to be semiconducting. Mm. And that sort of sense of you know, the coupling between structure and electronic structure was, um, was, was interesting. I was looking at that in Cambridge on some two-dimensional metals, and then ended up being sent to a wonderful group in Paris, um, actually my second year as a research student, and uh, specifically to do some experiments where we could measure electrical properties of uh, ensembles subjected to enormously high hydrostatic pressures. And pressure is a, a sort of physicist's alternative to chemical variation. It's a, a way of just modifying properties and switching the propensity of these materials to distort from metal to become semiconductor. And that was very productive. And it uh, caused me to decide to really finish my PhD in Paris. Mm. So I ended up um, spending a postdoc year before I had even contemplated writing my PhD. <laughs> I'd been elected to a research fellowship at St. John's in 1977. Mm. Uh, and that's when I switched away from the world of uh, inorganic materials to working with uh, molecules mm. um, and um, you know, carbon-based uh, conductors because that was the, the main research line in Paris. Mm. And that has turned out to be a, a theme that has kept mm. me going in various ways mm. since, since then. Mm. Mm. Who was your supervisor? I mean, was it a Cambridge person? Or? My Cambridge supervisor is um, A. Bioffi. Mm. Um, and then in Paris, uh, the so that was uh, Denis Jerome, who mm. yeah. has a lot, a lot of significant discoveries to his name. Mm. When, you, when you became a postdoc, you, did you teach at all, or were you just doing research? Oh, uh, as a grad student, I was doing my supervising to mm. earn a bit of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's sort of part, it, it, it's part of the rite of passage, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> learning how to do a bit of teaching. Mm. I mean, teaching I've 
I've always been frightened of. I always find a, a group of undergraduates much more terrifying than a thousand or so of my peers at some international conference. <laughs> it is a, it's, one, it's a variant of what I call uh, of, um, you know, Parkinson's law, that small decisions are much more difficult than big decisions. To spend a million pounds is much easier than mm. spending ten pounds. It's the same I find with teaching. And I, I can get terrified by one first year undergraduate. And then when I have to lecture, you know, hundreds of people, it's very simple. Oh, I think so. Yes. This is why I, I understand that people like Bush, you know, have an easy job. I mean, running in the United States is far easier than driving a bus into Cambridge. Well, he doesn't have to do it all by himself, <laughs> fortunately. That's also, also the case. And there. There's something about the face-to-face -face contact with mm. people mm. which is difficult. Have you done much teaching? I mean, this is anticipating, but much teaching after you became a presumably a university lecturer and well, I, I've done my, my bit. I, I've, I've done um, at least my share of teaching and examining. I've, I've sort of liked it. I wouldn't say I'm a born teacher. Mm. I, I, my the ratings from the undergraduates are not, not wonderful, but they're not disastrous. I, mm. I, I pass. Mm. That's for lectures or for the lectures and supervisions. Mm. I've, I've done all that. I, I've done all the college stuff. I did. I did. I, I did four years as a college tutor in St John's mm. um, from uh, uh, eighty-seven to whenever mm. ninety-three. You quite like lecturing. Not ninety-three, ninety, ninety-one. Yes. Um, lectures you quite enjoy giving lectures. Mm. Yes, I'm never as organised as I should be. They mm. tend to get done last minute. Mm. And sometimes I think they're good. <laughs> and sometimes you hope this, the audience think they're good too. Um, do you, uh, some people think that there's a kind of tension between teaching and research, but I was surprised to find that uh, a book I hadn't read for many years, I suppose, Cardinal Newman, and here's the idea of the university, said that universities were just purely for teaching. I mean, that was the only purpose of a university, whereas research should be done in things like the Royal Institution, the British Academy. You, know, you should have a complete separation. And as you know, some universities have been forced into this to keep up their ratings. Well, the, 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 the false assumption when we usually have this conversation in Cambridge is that when we say teaching we mean undergraduates mm -hmm. and of course for every two undergraduates we have one graduate student mm -hmm. a year and actually we give scant attention to what we offer our graduate students mm -hmm. a lot of the time they don't need it mm -hmm. but we we have failed to understand that this university has changed mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that the business of graduate teaching is is very interesting. I mean, it's not the same as undergraduate teaching mm. uh, in experimental science. It's perhaps, in some sense, aspects of it are like an apprenticeship. It's, mm. it's learning, learning how to use some tools, mm. but not, but then stopping short of telling or instructing a student what to do with the tools once acquired. Mm. Mm. Well, that used to be. I mean, the gap has grown bigger. That used to be the concept of undergraduate teaching too that you're transmitting tools and methods as well as content. The difficulty with physical sciences is that the subjects are hierarchical. Things have to be taught. There's, a, there's a, just a lot of stuff that has to be known. You, you, you have mm. to do it all. And it is, mm. it is dry. Um, we, I can quite reasonably like to teach efficiently, which means that we we teach, if you like, the, the consolidated understanding of a field rather than the, the pieces which were used to construct the field in the first instance. So the business of sort of rediscovering how you deal with incomplete information or conflicting models happens right at the end of the undergraduate period and of course is absolutely what you need to learn about mm. as you head off into um, time as a PhD student. Mm. But to go back, yes, I don't think we should be allowed to escape you know, all forms of contribution to the university. I think a sort of separation into um, those that have you know, what seem to be lowlier tasks and those who are too grand to have to do them would be disastrous. Mm. Would be quite wrong. 
and, and the, even the mixture of some admin, administrative or other duties. Um, I mean, it, a lot of people I, I've met, particularly from centralised universities, who've come here and said, you know, why can't we get hire some professional administrators and then get on with our research? But I've always valued the fact that we run our lives considerably ourselves. But I don't know what you feel, whether you could do with less committees. And well, you asked me this question at a good time. I'm in my fourth year as head of the School of Physical Sciences. Are you? Oh, I'm which amazed you're here and so calm. And <laughs> uh, which, which, is, which is interesting. I mean, I actually uh, have a very firm view that we need, well, academic leadership it, it could be much misinterpreted. Hmm. That I have no idea what the right things to do are, but I suppose because I still do it, I, I hope I have more sympathy with you know, the, the situation that um, other, you know, others find themselves in, or that, or that I'm appropriately um, not dogmatic about what is bound to work and what is bound not to work. And I do think that we should be seen to be led by people who take time out from doing the job, rather than creating a cadre of, of, of professional administrators. I, mm. I, and we are a bottom-up organisation for all the right reasons, but bottom-up um, works if there is a sort of ecosystem which has been designed from the top down, which may not be prescriptive, but has been skillfully designed to allow bottom-up to flourish. Mm. And I think the challenge of, of arranging that the infrastructure, that the, the, the broad direction of the institution uh, can allow that is, is, is really difficult. And I don't believe that people who are outside the business of research and teaching understand that. That's, a very, that's very well expressed and very interesting. I'm writing a history <coughs> analysis of how Cambridge works over the years. And that's how I see it too. Um, and I think on the whole, though I haven't got much comparative experience and I was going to ask you about that, it does seem to work rather well. Whereas it, you know, having watched top-down systems, um, some of the centralised London universities, and guessed at what's happening in America, they, don't, they have something very different. L looking back, hmm. I took for granted that I had freedoms in Cambridge. Hmm which I wouldn't have had anywhere else. As a, an, assist, an assistant lecturer, I had complete autonomy. I was never constrained for space. I always managed to have the resource I wanted for my research. I was given access to very bright research students. They weren't sort of scooped off and given to the grandees. And as I climbed up the career ladder here, I realized that to colleagues outside Cambridge and of course outside the UK who of course don't understand our strange titles for our various uh, tiers of, uh, of academic job uh, it made no difference I was just as able to do my work um, as assistant lecturer as I am as Cavendish professor it doesn't make any difference and it's good that Cambridge can do that Excellent. I'm d delighted you put it on record because that's that's been my experience too. There's been no real change from. Well, I have more to do now. Yeah. Somehow I, I'm, I'm loaded with more responsibility. In some mm. ways, it's harder. Mm. Uh, but I, I hope it's still the case that no matter what your rank is, mm. um, the, the freedom to do what you think you should do is there. To, let me, since you're so interesting on this, I'll ask you two other things which have been. I've been concerned with. One is the matter of trust. Mm. Um, many academic or intellectual institutions around the world are based on mistrust. Mm. That if you discover something interesting, you keep it from people. Mm. Um, private property and knowledge and, and so on. And that if you ask people their views on things, you have to allow for the fact that they'll probably try and deceive you unless there's a very good reason for them telling you the truth. This is a proposition from anthropology, so observations in many societies. Mm. But my experience is that Cambridge, there's a good deal of trust 
that you have to assume that people are going to tell you most of the truth when you ask them questions and that they will not hold back if you ask them the right questions. I don't know what your experience has been. I don't, it, you've confronted me with something that I hadn't thought about in those terms. Um, so I don't have a, a prepared answer. Good. I think, <laughs> I think it, 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 it's a bit of both. Hmm. I think it is. A lot of it depends on scale. The Cavendish is a little bit too large. It has. Um, there is some tribalism there. I mean, it's a little deep, deep rooted. I mean, long before I arrived there, so that there is considerable loyalty within a research group, but some rivalry between research groups, mm. which doesn't actually serve us well. We we don't necessarily share resources as well as we should. And maybe this is something which is well understood that there's a size, a, gr a group size within which up, um, it is possible to, to work on a basis of trust. But beyond that, um, it just becomes a bit too remote, mm. and, and therefore it um, it sort of fractionates into different pieces. I I, I, I think that is. I mean, Parkinson's law of committees is that mm. once they reach sixteen and above, they become no longer face-to-face -face committees, they become you know, different, uh, their, their chemistry changes, and it's clearly the case with organisations as well. This college, like King's, is probably too big to have proper communal feeling between the members. Once you get about, about 50 or 60 fellows, it's like that. I th well, uh, the research groups that I'm part of at the moment in the Cavendish, we are uh, hover around 50 people, there, there are two mm -hmm. other um, University teaching offices, uh, Neil Greenham and Henning Sewing House, and uh, we have a significant number of students and postdocs. That is absolutely the largest it can be. Mm. Uh, beyond that, it, it can't function as a, uh, as a cohesive group where, if, if you like, uh, members of the group uh, would expect to find companionship, friendship, social um, outlets, as well as work. Mm. And it's, I think, for uh, experimental science, is a very it's a sort of very sort of people-centric activity. It's, it's, it's there's a lot of sharing of know-how, a lot of helping of one another to um, get an experiment going, a lot of passing on of techniques from one to another, and you have to engineer that that's done well. Hmm. Well, I have been told by usually non-Americans who've been at U.S. universities that they can't quite believe it that within the group, you know, everyone tells everyone what they're doing. Um, because back in that group in the US, they were in competition with one another, and someone's success would mean that they would be more likely to get the job because they get a better letter from their supervisor. Well, this is what I'd, uh, I'd heard of. Um, I, and that's, I've heard that second hand, that's not, I, I, so I have to be careful that that's mm. you know, how, how I've had it really re relayed to me. Mm. Have you ever taught in an American university? Or? I, I have. I have taught um, when I was on sabbatical at uh, Santa Barbara in California mm. uh, 20 years ago. I, I taught a sophomore course, mm. um, Maxwell's equations. Mm. I was just allowed to use calculus, but only just. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever tempted? You must have had many offers from America. Yes, I've had lots of offers from America. You never tempted to go there? Not really. Why? Push or pull? Yeah. I. I don't think I can give a simple answer. Mm. Um, I think the, the bit that I can't cope with is that if I, is that Americans actually are at work all the time. If, if, you, if you want to get hold of a professor at an American university, you phone them during working hours and they pick the phone up. I find that really scary. I mean, I think I'm told I work a lot, mm. but I don't like to be at my desk all the time. Mm. I, and work is, you know, it's a more complex business. Mm. And I, I don't know. There's, there's a sort of, um, it, it's an awfully serious business there. I mean, I, uh, this may mm. sound ridiculous because mm. I do take my work seriously, but mm. I like to take it seriously in a context where I can appear to be not taking it seriously. Yes. It's, the, yeah, it's the sort of ambivalence of mm. um, my relationship with my job that I mm. like to be able to amuse myself with, and I don't think I can do that in the US. Mm. Well, I think D. H. Lawrence had some famous line, which my wife often quotes to me about, you know, if work is not fun, it's not worth doing. 
Yes. Or words to that effect. Yes. That's got to be a playful side to it. I, I think it's not quite taking myself seriously. Mm. But I mean, others, if they get a chance to listen to me saying this, will probably um, t t switch off in disgust or fall about laughing because they may regard me as um, <laughs> rather driven. No, this is very British. <laughs> uh, they'll just say, oh, that's very English. Um, so you, you never decided to go to America. And um, the other, the other um, thing which you alluded to, and I was just going to ask you about, well, actually on the trust matter, mm. you, you're in a very different situation from the arts and humanities and social mm. sciences. Nothing we do is of any value mm. in a capitalist society mm. in terms of mm. financial gains. And therefore we can squander our mm. small advances of knowledge in the knowledge that no student can take it away and do anything with it, or anyone else. In your case, um, you're in a world where there's a lot of money floating around. Mm. Does that not lead to firewalls and trust? And well, of course, yeah. I have been involved in uh, work which has uh, led to what have turned out to be very valuable inventions which we have protected by filing patents. Mm. Um, my sort of con the view that I've come to, um, I don't think I necessarily had it at the time, is that if you try to avoid putting yourself in a compromised position, you switch off opportunities. So there's nothing wrong in a conflict of interests, um, so long as you're open about it mm. and make sure that everybody who's some way associated with that conflict and knows what the issues are and knows mm. what the resolution is. Mm. So any uh, structure or set of rules that a university creates to sort of manage away that problem I think is um, deluding itself. I think you need to uh, just allow things to go where they're going to go and then be careful to manage it correctly. Mm. So yes, I've been involved in I've done a lot of patent filing. Out of that, we've I've been involved in forming a couple of companies. Mm -hmm. um, no one in the research group has ever been denied information um, uh, uh, about experimental results. We had an extremely important discovery in uh, 1989 when we discovered we could make uh, little um, diodes made with um, plastic materials, semiconducting plastics, which we were working on. Get to light up by putting a voltage across them. It's turned out to be very important. We have a fundamental patent that controls the use of that for any of those materials for anything that emits light when electrically excited. Um, but there were dozens of people in the Cavendish who knew about that before the patent was filed. We, we made no effort to keep it under wraps because we trusted that that's what people should be hmm. aware of what was going on. Why would they tell anybody outside? Hmm. Though, okay, uh, one of the Aaron Klug's stories was how he had invented uh, something mm. to do with scanning, I think it mm. was three-dimensional scanning, and uh, it was patented by an American scientist who then got the Nobel Prize. He wasn't worried about the patent, <laughs> it was the fact that the, by patenting it, mm. they, this man scooped his second Nobel Prize from him. Um, so that presumably occasionally could happen, but... Oh, well, um, the, the, the unpleasantness of, of, uh, of presumed deliberations over who get prizes and not, mm. or not uh, is something which can spoil a happy, a happy career, I'm sure. I, mean, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I, I think you have to sort of look. Get on with things. Get on with things. Um, mm. But I, the, com the, I mean, the real world um, is, is there. And a lot of science is very dependent on the real world. We need technology. Technology has usually been the um, it's been the biggest engine of discovery. Just being able to, to make things and measure things which were previously impossible mm. to to tackle just keeps on throwing up um, how bizarre, uh, unexpected the world turns out to be. So having a nose for where you can get, you know, use tools t to go exploring things which have not been regarded 
was worth looking at before. Uh, it's a surefire way of getting something good, mm. I, I would say. And that, that, that does take you into the world of, of industry, or mm. can do. Mm. I, I just see that as fair game. Mm. It's interesting, I mean, Martin Rees said that astronomy was largely driven by technology I and mean, the changes in the uh, measurement techniques. Yes, mm. yes, yes. And that's true with you too. Mm. It is true. Um, one of the messages that I, 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 mean, I get put on the spot because our companies have turned out to be, you know, as startup companies go, relatively significant. Mm. And I'm sort of constantly sort of asked to pronounce words of wisdom on the subject, which mm. is probably very unwise. But the one that I will will sign up to is that although I took a big risk taking time out, along with others, to get the company, the first company, Cambridge's Play Technology, going, and I'd somehow presumed that the company would head off at right angles to you know, my line of university work, uh, it didn't. It has continued to sustain the flat provide an engineering base, which has fed back into the university group. So here is the paradox: because we set up a company, we didn't have to do the engineering in the Cavendish; we could just do the science. 